Welcome to Bottom Up, a monthly podcast dedicated to issues and topics of interest to young lawyers in Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Emil Oviagele. And I'm Kristen Hardy. And we're your hosts. This is the Bottom Up Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another episode of the Bottom Up Podcast. Today we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Attorney Margaret Hickey, the immediate past president of the State Bar and uh, managing partner at Becker, Hickey and Poster, a family law firm here in Milwaukee. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Emil. Happy to be here. We are currently taping this episode at the Fister Hotel in Milwaukee. We just rounded up with the annual meeting and conference, the State Bar annual meeting and conference. It's been very hectic, I can imagine. Margaret? It has been, and it has been very productive as well. It's been great to be together with fellow lawyers, and we've had, I think, I don't even know how many tracks of CLE and some really inspirational speakers, and Kristen uh, just finished her year as chair of the Board of Governors with me, so we worked very hard together to accomplish a few things this year. The dream team. Congratulations, (laughs) congratulations. Uh, I have to say, uh, it was quite impactful, and it was quite amazing to see you guys work to tackle some pretty tough issues facing the bar at this time. Um, and I would say as an audience member, you you both did that with a lot of grace. And so thank you very much for your service. So what's next? You're just going to ride into the sunset? <laughs> what's next? Well, one of the things I love to do is travel. So I have a few things on the agenda for travel in the next year. And You know, you become past president, but that doesn't mean that you're done. It's a three-year term. And so I have to go to all the same meetings that I went to last year. I just don't have to be in charge of them. So um, I will still be uh, very active with the state bar, and that's not going to change. But I will also be taking some time off, for sure. Can we just take a step back? Because I think some of our listeners may not understand what the president of the bar does uh, and what the Board of Governors actually does. So could you give us a little explanation? Margaret, of our, your role and the role of the governors? Sure. So the Board of Governors first uh, are representatives of the various districts of the state of Wisconsin and then non-resident lawyers. And we have approximately 52 or 3 members of the Board of Governors. Districts are representational. So District 2, which is Milwaukee, has you know more governors than, let's say, Dane County, which has a, a fewer lawyers but is also... Um, has a lot of lawyers sort of by population. In addition to that, we have building bridges liaison. So those are the individuals who come from various um, affinity bars. And we have a representative of the lawyers who are um, in sections. So we have their chair come to the board. So we have, uh, it, it's, it's made up of a lot of different people. And the job of the president, along with the chair, is to set the agenda. We do that with the executive committee. And to move forward in a series of meetings, the issues that we're working on. So um, typically the board will go through a three meeting series of, you know, first meeting, we'll talk about the item, get introduced to the item. The second meeting, we'll have discussion. And the third meeting, we will vote. So um, my job with the other past president and then the incoming behind me president elect is to move those issues forward, uh, listening to the members of the board of governors and hopefully reach consensus with uh, your help, Kristen, as chair to manage us because managing a bunch of lawyers is not easy. So much fun. So full transparency, all of us have been members of the Board of Governors uh, in various capacities. So we have a front row seat. I'm trying to ensure that we are not talking amongst each other, friends, (laughs) and we let our listeners know just exactly what we're doing. So Mm -hmm. give us some examples of some issues. We don't have to talk about the hot issue, but give us examples of some issues that are discussed in those meetings. We can talk about the hot issue. We can talk about the hot (laughs) issue, but, you know, for example, let's just give a relatively easy example. There's going to be a petition coming forward from our um, ethics committee to change, make modification to the lawyer's oath. And so that committee brings that proposal to the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors, you know, talks it through, as I said, in that series of meetings. And ultimately, I think it was in our last meeting, we approved the board supporting that petition. The petition will actually be brought by the committee to the Supreme Court. But that's the kind of work that we do. Um, It involves legislation sometimes. It involves policies of the bar, you know, most recently we had this issue uh, that many have heard about, about the special purpose trust, trying to decide if we are going to try to protect some of our reserves in a trust so that we can um, secure financial stability for the state bar. So those are the things that we do. Some of them are mundane, 
and some of them are a little more exciting. In, in essence, it's it's the heartbeat of the state bar, so to speak. It's where the sausage gets made, or the is that is that the that's, right that's term? That's the saying. That's, that's the saying. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, I was really. It was, it was a very eye-opening experience for me. My year on the Board of Governors, I didn't realize how much goes into running the bar as an organizational entity, uh, the strategic planning, planning for today and for the future. I, I have a different and a profound sense of appreciation that I never had. I, I, I always had that, but it, it, and a different perception and appreciation for the work that goes into um, running the state bar. So... Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to serve. Well, um, let me just say the other thing that the presidents do that maybe I wasn't quite as familiar with, and I've been in, involved in bar activities for way over 20 years, but the presidents are your face outside of the state of Wisconsin. Yes. And so that's also important thing that we're doing. So we go to national conferences. We go to the National Bar Leaders Association. We go to the ABA. We go to a thing called Great Rivers, which is a, about, I think, nine different state bar leaders. And so the bar presidents are representing our members at those events as well. And one of the things that happens at those events that honestly is, is kind of the most interesting um, thing that you get to do is to learn from other presidents and leaders across the country about what's happening in their states and in their bars. And some of the bars are voluntary and some of the bars are mandatory, uh, but we're all kind of struggling with the same issues. So uh, learning from other bar leaders is something that I found interesting and challenging and eye-opening. So you probably racked up a lot of miles. Uh, last year. You know, not so many miles. Uh, the bar is very cautious <laughs> with the st- with the money of the members. Uh, we don't go crazy, but we went to a few a few nice places. I won't deny it. Like a hundred thousand miles. No. Or? Oh, are you kidding me? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, if we went to three meetings a year, you know, uh, three flights a year, it's it's not enough to get a free air uh, free airplane anywhere. Believe me. Yeah. I know, but but one of the one of the things I know the the bar presidents tend to do a lot of is just traveling around the state, ensuring that um all of our constituents are heard from. So how was that experience for you? I would say that's one of the best experiences, you know, meeting members where they are, where they live, where they practice. It's really fun um, getting to see them in their communities. And some of that we did with legislators where we got to meet with the local legislators and the bar members in that community. And so I, I really enjoyed that. I probably did more of that travel when I was campaigning even than when I was president. But but meeting the members and hearing their concerns, that's a big part of, of what we do. And it's, it is really fun to be, you might be in Menominee or you might be in La Crosse or you might be in Wausau, wherever it is, talking to members. Kenosha, we had a meeting in Kenosha, um, just being able to listen to what they're dealing with. Uh, that might definitely vary from community to community. So you were a part of the first time in the state bar's history, an all-woman executive team. Is it just the, the officers? I can't remember. No. Um, it was it was it was treasurer, the past president, secretary, the and all the presidents, president yep. elect, and current chair. president, chair, and yeah. then that just kind of dovetailing into your firm that is made up of all women partners. So tell me, how is it being a part of something historic like that? Well, I would tell you that it's a little bit, from my perspective, and I've been practicing 37 years, uh, it's a little bit of feeling of it's about time. Mm-hmm. And when I started practicing, my law partner, Barb Becker, who's now retired, uh, when she graduated, her law school class was about 10% women. And now I understand that the law school classes coming out are 50% or more women. So it's probably taken 30 or 40 years to get to this point where we have um, all we had all women in leadership. And I don't think it's good or bad, men versus women. I don't have any feelings that way. But I do think that women have done the hard work Mm -hmm. to get to the positions of leadership. So I think that um, it's nice to see that recognition. It does make a difference in one's career to have achieved certain milestones, and um, leadership is part of that. So I think it's been uh, a lot of fun. But, you know, we got Dean coming up, and, you know, he'll be he'll be excellent as well. Yeah, so he'll be great. It's not just uh, that we have an all-women's club or anything like that, but it's nice to see women recognized. And now, a word from our sponsors. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Wilmick. A legal malpractice claim can threaten the financial security of your law firm and your clients. Wilmick has Wisconsin licensed claims attorneys to help you navigate through a malpractice claim. 
will make it by Wisconsin lawyers for Wisconsin lawyers. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Yeah. In, in fact, just talking about Dean, and I'm assuming in the future we're going to have him on, on the podcast, but uh, I was telling Kristen yesterday, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also very excited um, for his for his leadership as well. And I, and I know, you know, in recent times, there's been a lot more emphasis on, you know, diversity in terms of, uh, for lack of a better word, with an emphasis on non-white, non-white uh, heterosexual uh, uh, men. And to have Dean's experience at the bar at this time, and he's also, and he also embodies what I hope we can all be when we have that level of experience. He's so open, still so malleable, and still so humble, and it's it's really fantastic. And I think that should be the goal because at the end of the day, is it, it's not necessarily a demographic issue. It's about what are your perspectives and are you willing to broaden the table or at least have more folks at the table? And he's shown a willingness to continue that charge because I know diversity was one of the big things that you uh, worked on during your time. So segueing into that, tell me about some of the diversity initiatives that you worked on during your time as president. Well, I got to start before that because I was on the Diversity Inclusion Oversight Committee uh, going back at least eight years now. Um, so that I had done about a, I don't know, 10 year stint on and off on the Board of Governors and I was in an elected position. I don't remember. I think it was treasurer. And then I ended my time on the Board of Governors. And when I went off, Carl Ashley, Judge Carl Ashley was chair of diversity, inclusion, oversight. And I said, you know, if you're going to put me anywhere, can I please be on that committee? So uh, I've been serving on that committee ever since. And so this is very important to me. It's a value that I hold that we need everyone at the table and we need, Dean talked a little bit about this uh, in his swearing in ceremony about inclusion. Inclusion is hearing, not just being there, but being listened to, being part of the conversation. So that's been a a deep value of mine. Um, It is a strategic value of the State Bar of Wisconsin. So there cannot be a leader at this point, in my opinion, who does not have that as part of their value. And so Dean is going to carry that forward. I know that he will. And you know, the world we live in is diverse in, in so many ways. And hearing everyone's opinion makes us better. The experiences of others, from whether it's a background difference or a gender identity difference or a ethnic or a geographic, all those variables add to the conversation and the value of what we, what we do. Nothing there takes away. And in fact, if we don't, uh, listen to diverse voices and have diverse people at the table, I think we're going to become irrelevant. I don't think the world that we live in, we can keep doing everything the way we always did it. So I think that the bar uh, has put this issue front and center, and I hope that that will continue to be a part of our strategic plan. Yeah, Margaret, I think you did a, a great dra- job in many ways this year in your term, and you'll continue as past president doing a great job, but bringing attention to those issues and keeping it at the forefront of everything that you were doing, which I personally appreciate. But I, I also want to just talk about, there is a, di- so this was a tough year, I think, uh, in my opinion, as chair, sure. it was a tough year, and I've been on the board not as chair when it was not as tough a year where the conversations were not as contentious. So talk to me, talk to us a little bit uh, about how you navigated those discussions, because I know I personally felt sometimes you have to strike a balance Mm -hmm. and that's what leadership is about. But especially when we're talking to a room full of attorneys. So trying to strike that balance, allow everyone to be heard, say your piece and your thoughts, and then bring it back around to where people can advocate for their constituents. So how was that for you this year in kind of a contentious situation? I think the biggest thing that I tried to do and the other leaders tried to do was, first of all, educate. Educate the Board of Governors about, especially on the trust issue. And, you know, there's been some criticism that we did it behind closed doors. But we and had and, and just, just, so, just so our listeners can mm-hmm. get a sense of a background, sure. just, give them, just tell them what the trust issue resolution was all about, just high-level sure. stuff. So the Board of Governors has voted to uh, permit the transfer of a portion of our reserves uh, into a what's called a special purpose trust. The transfer of those assets would be an irrevocable decision, but the special purpose trust, uh, assuming that it is now created based upon the vote of the board, will have the exact same 
purposes as the State Bar of Wisconsin and the trustees in that entity will be current and past elected members of the state bar, so presidents, past presidents, and our our executive director. And there'll also be trust protectors for those who do uh, state and trust law. They know what trust protectors are to make sure that the trust actually does what it's supposed to do. So that was approved in the last Board of Governors meeting. And yes, it has been a fairly contentious issue. And so part of what we tried to do in leadership was to educate. So first of all, we had to bring in our lawyers to you know, explain what the trust is and how it would function. And we had a lot of excellent, really excellent questions from the governors, legal questions. And so one of the reasons that a lot of our discussions were held in closed session was that we were talking to our attorneys and getting answers from our attorneys and asking further questions. And so then in the last few months, we've been able to come out and say, okay, let the membership know we're we're talking about this issue, get feedback from membership, uh, and then ultimately have the discussion and vote at the Board of Governors. So I think the key has been to make sure that all voices are heard. And then, you know, Kristen, you did a phenomenal job in, in doing that and even saying to people, look, you know, you can speak again, but you're going to maybe be time limited given that our board meetings have sometimes time limitations. But I do think we heard from all the various points of view um, so that when we did make our decision, it was based upon a thoughtful discussion and an open discussion. So I, I think that's the best we can do. People may not like the result. There will be members who are not happy with the result, but um, the Board of Governors was elected to make these decisions, and after a lot of study, this was the decision that we made. Can you just shine some light on on, on how, how it must have felt, or, or on the personal level, navigating these, you know, these tougher times, right? Um, to a large extent, everyone wants, or every leader would, would want their decisions to be backed 100% by everyone, right? Um, and I do think that as a leader, there are times where you have to make hard decisions that at the time may not necessarily gain unanimous cons- uh, consensus. And, and how do you deal with that friction and how do you still find the resolve and boldness um, to forge your head? Well, one of the things I've really enjoyed in the last several years is that um, as president or president-elect, we're, we're, we collaborate, okay? So the three presidents plus our exec director and then our executive committee, we all work together, you know? So I never felt this was all on me or all, you know, something that, quite frankly, I had to achieve. Um, I tried to put forward what we as leaders thought was the best for the state bar, but I also knew that ultimately that decision was going to be by the Board of Governors. It, it wasn't going to be my decision, and all I could really do was advocate for it the best I know how, and then let the board make its decision. You know, there have been a few sleepless nights, I'm not going to kid you, and uh, I think that it's a it, it was a big decision, so, you know, you worry about making sure you have the right process and then the right, ideally, the right outcome. So, I think having that collaboration helped me a lot in terms of working uh, with the other leaders and and um, feeling that we were kind of we were united and that helped a lot. And now a word from our sponsors. The Marine Corps JAG program is seeking highly qualified law students and attorneys to serve their country as a part of the Judge Advocate Division. This challenging path of becoming a Marine officer offers many benefits to you and your family, unparalleled professional experience, and worldwide travel opportunities. Contact your local officer selection officer, Captain Leesman, at 414-297-1933 to find out more. That's 414-297-1933. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. I don't know if the the board always, the executive committee and the presidents and staff are always this engaged, but I know from my perspective, everyone was so engaged and showed up with questions and answers and thoughts that it makes it a little bit easier to do the work. I mean, as chair, I could not do, I could not ever be the chair without Jan or Larry, yeah. <laughs> like I, I needed them. And that's really helpful. So that's the beautiful thing I think about any state bar engagement is that you have so many people, you don't get involved in this work and this volunteer work you know, for the glory, you get involved because you care about the profession and you wanna make it better. And you see that from the individuals who are elected and who, uh, who work here, so. 
I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we can disagree, and, and that's fine. Um, and lawyers, we do disagree. That's kind of what we do professionally, <laughs> professionally sometimes, right? But we can do it respectfully. And even the people who didn't necessarily vote the way I did, I still have tremendous respect for them. They put in the hours and the work, and uh, they're doing what they think is best, uh, you know, from their point of view. So I think that is key that we are ultimately professionals responsible yeah. you know for trying to lead this organization but but we're not personally affronted and, and i think it was nice to see lawyers uh be be so vested and everyone be so vested in the process uh, there was a lot of passion and what i loved the most about it was there weren't a lot of caveats about expressing that passion i do feel that sometimes in society today Every disagreement starts with, it's not personal, right. you know, but, but there was that, I think, understanding and, you know, and bridges of trust. So even when at times when it did get contentious, at least I never felt that um, it got personal, even though at times you could view it as such, but no one got offended. And it was just that the, the passion was such, it, for me, it was um, edifying. Mm. Because I feel like at times in society, I don't know if you have this problem, Kristen, at times when I'm not talking in court to other people, I have to be like, oh, I mean, are you being too passionate? Would they think you're angry? Or, you know, like, hey, hey, I'm not angry. This is how I talk. Right, like, yeah. I'm very, but it was so liberating to be part of a group and part of a body where we didn't have to give those trigger, <laughs> trigger mm. alerts, we end up, which usually ends up being more triggering than. What's That's a good point, that? Emil. I didn't think about that, but you're absolutely right, especially thinking about this last me meeting. I think everyone has tremendous respect for one another, and it, clearly there were heightened conversations. But after, even people were like, I hope you didn't feel... I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I didn't feel like anything. I felt like you wanted to get your point across, and I'm the chair, and you need my attention to get your point across. Yeah. Totally fine. And, and what, I, what I would also say, Kristen, at least with you being chair this year, given the nature of the conversations we had, the issues we're dealing with, how, you know, how pa impassioned people were at times, the times you needed to step in to sort of calm things down or cut people off, it was, people were very respectful of that. They were. Um, and as younger lawyers um, who are sometimes placed in positions of authority, we don't always get that level of compliance. And That's so, true. and I think it's a testament to our state bar. And yes. uh, I mean, I am, so lucky and so proud of this organization and being part of a body in a state where the lawyers have been very, very understanding, welcoming and respectful. And I, I think our bar, you know, deserves special recognition. I don't know if, if it were on a coast, it could have been. <laughs> yeah. I agree with that. And I also think it's a testament to leadership, right? Yeah. Because everyone's following the leader. So it's Margaret, it's Cheryl, it's Dean, who those are, if it was getting contentious, I knew that those three would step in and back me up just yeah. in case where it was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't say too much and I should let people talk. And they would step in and go, nope, that's enough. Okay. You know, I think, I think the chair is running the show. That's enough. So yeah, that's reflective of leadership. The people who join, who are elected to, to a body like this, and then the leadership who's elected, you can see that there's civility here. There is respect. There is friendship. All of that exists uh, in the board of governors and does it sound like we're making a pitch for the Board of Governors? Yes, <laughs> we are. Um, it's a wonderful thing to join. It is. No, let's talk about some of your, you know, other accomplishments. If, if you could name three things you're, you're most proud of in terms that you got to oversee or accomplish during your term, what would those be? Or your career. It doesn't just have to be your term. Or your career. Okay, that's a tough one. Certainly in the last year at the Board of Governors, being able to push really hard on the funding for the criminal justice system, I think it's something that actually will make a huge difference in the lives of the citizens of the state of Wisconsin to properly fund district attorneys and public defenders and the justice uh, system itself. And I'm a civil litigator. I don't do criminal law, but I know very well that when the criminal law part of our system is not functioning well, there's a lot of spillover into civil court. And so, for example, in family court, we used to have five judges. Well, then for a while, we only had four judges. Why? Because we needed more judges mm -hmm. in criminal court. So that's how it is. You know, the, the civil court comes second, uh, and it, as well it should in our system. So that's a huge accomplishment. I also was able to make some appointments, you know, as 
president. You get to make appointments um, both to committees at the beginning of the year and then to a couple of different entities during the year. And I try to be really thoughtful about those appointments and make sure that we are, for example, getting younger lawyers involved. I mean, to me, you know, this is the lifeblood of our organization. We need young lawyers to care and to they're willing to volunteer. We need to put them in places where they're going to be able to make uh, a meaningful difference and they're going to feel valued. And the same with uh, diversity, making sure that the makeup of different committees and boards is diverse and does reflect better uh, than in the past you know, who lawyers are, but also who our community is. So those are things that I, I'm particularly proud of. In my professional life, uh, I think that one of the big things um, is to have had my own, run my own firm now for 32 years. When I started out, I never imagined that it would grow from two lawyers uh, up to six and that we would have long, long-term employees that we, we support and who support us. So that, that's meant a lot to me to have that longevity. And now, a word from our sponsors. Hi, Russell Nicolay here with Nicolay Law, Accident and Injury Lawyers. If you have clients that have been injured, my office would love the opportunity to help them get compensated and get their life back on track. We handle referrals and co-counsel relationships on injury cases all across Wisconsin. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Let's, let's pivot from, let's take like a good place to pivot from Mar uh, Margaret Hickey, state bar leader, to Margaret Hickey, the attorney and in, in person, right? So you've been you've you've been practicing for about thirty seven years. You've owned your own law firm for thirty two. So you started your, at least you became part of your law firm. Started your law firm five years out of law school. Correct. Thirty two years ago. Yep. <laughs> in Wisconsin. Correct. All right. What was that like? Uh, scary. That was really scary. So the I had been at two prior firms. The first firm I left uh, after several years. And the second firm uh, was about 35 lawyers, and it kind of disintegrated. And uh, when it fell apart, Barb Becker asked me to go into business with her. Well, Barb was out of law school about 10 years more than me, so I'm out five. She's out 15. She had been a managing partner at this law firm before the firm ended, and so she kind of knew how to run a business. I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew nothing. And I honestly um, still can't thank her enough for, you know, bringing me along and seeing some kind of, you know, potential in me because I was really young and, and didn't know what I was doing. And from there, um, you know, Barb and I just grew the firm. And I think that I would say to people who are in that position today, yeah, it's scary, but you can do it. Uh, and one of the things that reasons that you can do it is you can get help from the state bar. We reached out to so many different places for help at the beginning, you know, in terms of information. I know nothing about insurance and you know now we got to buy cyber insurance i don't even know what that is you know i mean all these things you have to learn um not even talking about people management to run a law firm that have nothing to do with the practice of law they're just other stuff so i think that having support you know within the state bar but also uh, by my colleagues um was made all the difference in the world if you could give some advice to a young associate margaret hickey what would that advice be let's say you're five years out, getting ready to go to this new, brand new firm. What would that advice be? I think that, you know, you're strong enough to do what it takes and that even though there will be ups and downs, um, it's going to be worth it. Uh, I'm somebody, I need to be my own boss. You guys both know me well enough to know that I probably can't get bossed around by anybody. <laughs> and so that has been really helpful to me to, to be my own boss. And if I'd known then that, you know, it was going to be okay and, you know, that I was going to make it through. And that it has meaning. You know, it has meaning. Um, Amelia, you're in this position. You're giving jobs to other people. That ha That's meaningful. You know, you're supporting other families. You're uh, and you can decide also, and I'll stop giving advice to myself, but you get to decide what cases you're going to take and not take. And that's nice, too, because if someone comes in the door and, and they can't afford me, but I think they have a really good case that needs help, I'm going to take it, and I can take it, and I have that freedom. Mm -hmm. So I think that the the benefits greatly outweigh, you know, kind of the scariness and the and the uncertainty of it. And, and Kristen, feel free to jump in here, but but I also think from what you just said, because given the you know our audience and the fact that some of them may not be in private practice, I think that there there are lessons that are applicable across the board. I mean, from your story, we hear of a fifty year attorney who decides to take some ownership 
and, and take a risk and maybe, you know, travel the path less, tra- you know, go on a path less traveled. And I think that's something that folks, whether or not they're working in government, practicing in a, in a, in a legal, legal adjacent role or in-house can do. And it's something that, you know, Christian and I, we, you know, we talk about on this show a lot, that figuring out and trying to find your path within the law or outside of the law. Mm-hmm. Christian, what do you have to say yeah, about that? I completely agree. I feel like we've had this conversation practically every episode where we talk about owning your career figuring out what's meaningful and what works for you, and then going at it full force. And you have certainly done that. You know, Mule has done that. And I'm always so impressed and I respect people so much who kind of go their own way and figure it out. And I think it's good for our viewers to hear that no matter where you are right now in your career, you always have the opportunity to pivot and go your own way and what works for you at that moment. And I would like to give another example of going a different direction because uh, my husband was out 25 years, had been a civil litigator in a medium-sized firm, you know, fairly quite successful, if you use money as the standard of success. And he was not enjoying himself. And he was just not, it just wasn't for him anymore, even though he'd always wanted to be a lawyer. And so he left practicing law for a few years. And then when he went back to work, he went to work running a nonprofit mm. uh, for people with serious mental illness uh, issues, and he said that was the most gratifying job that he ever held. He did that for about 10 years before he retired. He used all his skills as a lawyer. You know, we have a lot of skills in terms of being able to understand and solve problems and being able to work with people and going to look for solutions when you don't know what, what the answer is, uh, relying on others, um, which sometimes we have to rely on other experts. So uh, he, he stopped being a lawyer, mm-hmm. and that was right for him. And that's okay, too, as long as you, like you said, look for your path and then follow it. And, and change, although it's scary, it, it often is really good. I, I, I oftentimes think to myself, and you've probably seen this happen, where folks who used to be lawyers or who decide not to be in a traditional legal role tell other lawyers who are currently practicing, like, oh, yeah, you know, I just decided it's something different. The lawyers currently practice and look at them like they, like, you know, like, like they're in headlights, like, uh, uh, are, you, are you crazy? And I'm like, I've changed my perception whenever I hear that story or anyone telling me of their path. I actually make I make a conscious effort to, to, to glorify it and say, we, you know, we do need more of this. Like, because I do think that we're called to be lots of things. And, and yes, it's 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 a it's a very valiant profession. Um, but I also think that part of our mental health struggles comes from the fact that too many people feel trapped. Too many people don't know what they are without the law. Mm-hmm. And it's something that we need to glorify more. And you know, even thinking about what your husband did, I'm brought back to um, um, Magda's journey, you know, from uh, from our last episode, um, that that sense of like, hey, I, I am in control. It is my career. I could go into a legal adjacent role, back into legal, into HR. Um, and, and there are very few professions and degrees or whatever that actually allow you that flexibility. And I don't think lawyers or we as professionals take advantage of that enough and now a word from our sponsors state bar of wisconsin members can apply for accident insurance which provides quick access to money for covered injury related expenses coverage is issued by the prudential insurance company of america to learn more visit wisbar.memberenroll.com Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. I think you're right about the trap feeling. I think a lot of people get to a certain point in their career and it's really hard to pivot because they've set either a certain standard of living or a certain bar for themselves about what they need to do or what who they need to be. But if you step back and look at the skill set that you've developed, you know, in 10 or 15 or 20 years, uh, it's pretty amazing. And those convert into a lot of other things. And, and it's not as hard to transition to something different, even within the law, I think, as people think it is. So, and one of the things that I would suggest is, you know, talk to a lot of people because you're going to hear a lot of different stories and you're going to hear different ways of doing that thing that you might want to accomplish. And I have, in my career, I've never had anyone refuse to kind of give me their thoughts. You know, when I was struggling with something and I, boy, I turned to other lawyers for advice a lot and they're always there. They're always willing uh, to, to, 
to step up and say, yeah, hey, this is what I did or what I think or have you considered this or the other thing? And that's something that um, lawyers are, it, it, I don't know if other professions do that, but it's pretty cool about lawyers. So if you weren't, speaking of which, if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? Well, I mean, if I could be a travel writer. <laughs> I don't know if anybody really can make any living being a travel writer, but I do love it. Anthony love Bourdain it. did. Yeah. A very good one. Yeah, he did. Uh, we won't talk about him. It's too sad. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I used to think that I wanted to do something in um, either government or international relations. And um, I do speak Spanish. I did spend a year living in South America when I was young. And so my first love kind of was to do something, um, you know, in uh, Latin American, you know, politics. And even when I was in law school, I worked with a couple of professors on issues related to that. But, you know, your path doesn't go where you think it's going to go. And I, I'm doing elder law and family law now. And never in a million years did I think when I graduated from law school, that's what I would do. But hey, you look for what you're good at and you try uh, to find something that you feel good about because what we do every day is hard it's hard work no matter what you know whether you're in-house or whether you're private practice or whether you're government it's hard work so it helps to have something that you enjoy i think i just ended up here because it seemed like as crazy as it sounds those are things i enjoy doing work with people solving their problems that does not sound crazy to a captive audience of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> we all, that's how we all feel. So you just mentioned that, you, you know, you practice in the field of family law and elder law. And, you know, you never imagined when you got out of law school that that would be your field. So kind of walk, walk us through how you found that path, because there are lots of newer lawyers, you know, coming out of law school, trying to figure out what type of lawyer do I, you know, I, they want to become. So completely by accident, I found this path. Uh, when I spent my first few years out, I was doing civil litigation, and I did insurance defense, and I did some securities litigation, and I tried a jury trial. <laughs> but when I left that law firm, I wanted to do something a little different. I wanted to keep doing those things. And when I met Barb Becker, she said to me, well, I do elder law and family law, and if you're going to come to our firm, you know, you have to do that and learn that with me. And I said, um, yeah, but what if I don't like it? And so she and I had this conversation where uh, she said, okay, you're going to try it. If you don't like it, then I won't force you to keep doing it, which I don't know if anyone's ever forced me to do anything. <laughs> but anyway, um, I did like it. I tried it, and, and, and I did like it. And I kept doing other things. I did some immigration law early in my practice, and I kept doing securities work, and I kept doing personal injury work. Uh, but after a while, it was like, well, no, I don't, I'm not enjoying those things. And so when Barb and I left the firm and started our own firm, we decided to focus on only those two things. Um, so I wound down all my other kinds of practice, and I, I think it's been great. I mean, one of the things that I find is that you're never done learning, but at least it's nice to know the basis of the area that you practice in and that you don't have to, like, I don't have 10 things I'm trying to be good at, you know? Yeah. So um, I think having a couple things and being good at those helps me to feel more confident that I'm, I'm doing things right. So was a really accidental. Do you, th you think those th th those early days of sampling helped you find your fit? Because at times I do think that uh, there is this need and pressure for hyper-specialization uh, very early on in the careers of lawyers. What do you have to say about that? Well, I would hope that lawyers, young lawyers, are not force too much into, you know, you're going to do this one thing for the first three to five years, or, you know, you're going to be limited to, you know, I, I don't even know because I don't do corporate work, so I can't even use the right labels. But Because if you don't try other things, then you're never going to know. And maybe there's a way to sample those things like you suggested by doing some volunteer work. Okay, so like I go to the Brief Legal Advice Clinic, and, you know, you can go to the Brief Legal Advice Clinic as a volunteer for a couple hours, and you don't have to know landlord-tenant law, and you don't have to know family law, and you don't have to know probate because you're going to look things up with the law student, and you're going to be able to answer basic questions. Uh, and so that's a way to try some things out. I've also done some other volunteer work with the local um, – different bars, local bars, doing powers of attorney, for example, to learn how to do that. Um, and I know they have like Wills for Heroes as part of the state bar. So there's lots of ways you can try some things, even if it's not necessarily at your law firm. But I would highly recommend it because you might not know what's right for you until you've tried it. You can't guess. I, I agree. And now a word from our sponsors. Ahoy, ye scurvy dogs. 
For a treasure most splendid awaits ye. Pinnacle Ultimate Pass Gold grants ye tuition-free access to every live event, webcast, webcast, replay, telephone seminar, and on-demand Pinnacle event. So set sail on the voyage of knowledge with the Pinnacle Ultimate Pass Gold. It be a pirate's dream come true. Yarr. Thank you. And now back to the Bottom Up Podcast. Uh, so what's next? We asked that early on. Emil jumped the gun asking what was next, but... You're now past president, and then also in the practice, what's next for you? I know you have this big vacation coming up, <laughs> but I mean, big picture, what do you see as maybe your next role with the Board of Governors? Are you done? This is it. No, I won't be done. Uh, I think one of the best things about being a lawyer is the giving back to the profession, and you know, uh, we do our jobs every day, but we get really down to the minutia, right? And in my job, the minutia might be who's going to get the plates and who's going to get the dog. And uh, they're fighting about, you know, a retirement plan and how to divide a retirement plan. So the minutia can be things that maybe are big to the client, but are not all, always big to us. And so when I go to a board of governors meeting or I go to a state bar meeting, I'm going to talk about the big ideas. You know, I'm going to get to talk about things that really make a difference to the profession and, and maybe influence those things, which um, I think is a good thing if we can uh, make a difference. When I have gone a couple times now to speak on legislation to the legislature, this is more when I was working with the family law section and the elder law section, uh, it, it makes a difference when the legislators can ask you questions about something that they're thinking about passing and they don't really always realize how that proposed law might affect the laws that are already in place. So you're really making a difference. And that's what I've really loved about my volunteer work. All throughout my career, I've probably given about, on average, 20% of my time for volunteer work. And I'm so nerdy that I keep track. Um, <laughs> but for me, it's just an important way of, of feeling like, yeah, I'm still working on this big, meaningful piece of work um, in addition to my everyday work. I'm going to continue to stay on the Diversity Inclusion Oversight Committee. They can't get rid of me. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to continue to work with um, Dean on the Greater Wisconsin Initiative because we really want to get some things moving to get lawyers out into those places, uh, what we call legal deserts, where there aren't enough attorneys. And there's a lot of work, a lot of really good work. And I've heard some stories lately about lawyers working remotely in those areas. So it's not that you necessarily have to move um, way out state, but you might be able to do it part time. So I'll work on those things. And then, you know, I'm kind of getting in theory to the place of my career where, um, you know, I'll probably do more uh, pro bono and things that in family law, you know, something like 90% of people go without representation, which is just pitiful. And so one of the awards that we saw the other night at the award ceremony was a couple lawyers who are just doing not-for-profit family law. I mean, to me, that's really appealing because I think I have all the skills and there's a lot of people who can't afford my services. So I'm really hoping that down the road I can do more of that kind of work. May, may I suggest uh, also uh, starting uh, your travel blog um, <laughs> as well? Um, we, you know, and please, given the fact that you've had a very successful career, I mean, yourself and your husband, maybe consider hiring me on. We can travel <laughs> around the world, giving pro bono legal advice, love eating it. good food. There you go. Love um, it. You know. <laughs> love it. Love it. I haven't figured out a way how to get paid for my travel. I know people do it, and I know those bloggers who are so good at that. Maybe I'll try to figure that out. But We're professional uh, writers. We can always make it work. <laughs> true, 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 true. I just don't know how to raise money. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not we'll, as good at that as I should be. We'll put our heads together and figure all right. it out. Just let us know when you're ready, all right? All right, yeah. all right. I'm ready. I'll let you know. <laughs> yep, well, yep. Margaret, it has been an honor to be your chair and serve with you. I appreciate you for coming on this podcast but also for being our president and for selecting me to have that honor. So thank you so much for being here. This is awesome to hear more of your story. I wish we were having this conversation over some good food, but that's okay. Uh, we got to work on that. We got to do more of that. Yeah. Right? It is called bottom up. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> for other reasons, I should yeah. say. Oh, yeah, we need more. Where are the sponsors? We will talk about your delicious food right here on air if you yeah. provide us with meals. Absolutely. So, a little, you know, zig in, zig out, taste test. Like, hey, all right. Hey, how was the chocolate? It was good. How was the food? It was awesome. How was the bourbon? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> any, Thank you any very much. Final words, Margaret. 
No, I, I really thank you for the opportunity to talk a little more casually. Uh, and honestly, it's been a great pleasure, you know, working with both of you, Kristen and Emil, on, on the board and otherwise. Uh, we've worked it with each other in other places as well. And I am confident about the future of the bar because of the two of you and people like you. You just bring so much energy, so much intelligence and thoughtfulness to this process. And you're, you're going to make everything go well, you and others like you, in terms of young lawyers. And that's where the profession is heading, the direction that you take us. Thank you. That's so kind. Thank you, Margaret. Well, thank you so much for everything. You, it's been an honor. Uh, you've been an inspiration in all that you do, and I can't wait uh, to, to see that have a blog launch. You know, so <laughs> just do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, listeners. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to explore, let us know. I'm your host, Emil Ovia Gailey, and we'll catch you next time.